Joining us for this segment is State Auditor Susan Bump. Uh, Auditor, welcome. I am delighted to be back, Kevin. Thank you. It's been a while. It has been a while, and uh, I've been looking forward to you know, having a conversation. Unfortunately, we get this little pandemic that's kind of mm. shuffled our lives around and kind of made things a little bit difficult and different. So That's for sure. Uh, we have a couple of great topics to talk about, I think, the, but before we get started, it's worth making sure the folks understand fully what it is that the State Auditor's Office does, especially when it comes to state government and for the protection of the residents. Well, thanks, Kevin. I really do appreciate the opportunity to uh, to talk about the work that uh, the office does. Um, you know, as the name suggests, we do auditing, but but a lot of people think that that means that we do financial auditing for the state, but really we do what's called performance auditing. So yes, we care about how how. Um, how money has been spent, how much has been spent. Um, what we also want to look at, though, in our performance auditing is whether proper safeguards have been enacted to ensure that it's not subject to waste, fraud, abuse, you know, that unholy trinity of things that can go wrong um, with, uh, with state finances. And we also want to see, see that agencies are using the money effectively to fulfill their missions to the, to the public. So that makes up the bulk of what we do. We audit every uh, department of state government on a three-year uh, a three-year cycle. Uh, I really have a lot of discretion here in my office to decide what exactly we're going to look at when we, whenever we look at a department. Uh, we actually get a lot of feedback, though, and input from uh, members of the public and from uh, members of the legislature as well. Uh, a couple of other things that the office does, though, is conduct uh, public uh, assistance benefits fraud. Uh, we work with agencies like the Department of Transitional Assistance and MassHealth uh, to investigate folks who we suspect are getting benefits that they are not entitled to. They may have been hiding income. They may have been uh, uh, claiming that they had a dependent uh, child uh, in their home when the child was not present in the home and the, and the like. So that's a, another big piece of the work. Um, and then another part of the work that we do that I know you really want to talk about today um, comes under the uh, uh, division of local mandates. So we hear, particularly if you're involved in local government, the idea of uh, you know, unfunded mandates. You know, the state imposes requirements on municipalities to do this, that, or the other thing, but this, that, or the other thing has a cost. And the question is who should be paying for it? And there's a legal analysis that we have to apply uh, when we are asked by a municipality or a legislator for that matter, um, as to who's responsible, the local taxpayers or state government um, for funding uh, particular programs and do the financial analysis. We've been very busy with local elections officials, for instance, um, the pandemic, you mentioned the pandemic and all of the changes in methods of voting. Some of that, those costs are borne by municipalities themselves, but others are borne by the state and we have a role in helping sort that out. I think before we, we move into our, our first topic, um, we should probably, I should congratulate you and congratulate your office. My understanding is, is that uh, someone in your office has been, been bestowed uh, the uh, William R. Snodgrass Distinguished Leadership Award. I think it's uh, one of your first deputy auditors. Is that correct? Yeah, you know, uh, thank you for mentioning that. Um, uh, Meredith Barrio was one of the first uh, hires that I made when I took the office. She came from the private sector. I, and I brought her in because we needed to upgrade our, our policies and procedures so that our work was meeting 
the standards that are set for government auditing by the federal government. And uh, Meredith, so Meredith has been with me uh, for uh, 11 years, um, almost uh, 11 years. She's worked her way up to be the first deputy auditor. And she has been really responsible for initiating a whole uh, quality control unit, uh, if you will, within the office, enhancing our training. Um, we, you know, when I came on board, I asked for a peer review to be done by the State Auditors Association, and the office did not get good marks on that. We've had two subsequent peer reviews uh, to make sure, you know, to, so a kind of certificate of uh, of excellence and under her under her leadership we have uh, we have twice succeeded in getting the highest uh, level you could so it's a it's a real feather in her cap uh, I get a lot of credit for for uh, for turning the office around but Meredith has been right there beside me and she was just recognized by national organization the Association of Government uh, uh, Accountants so it's very exciting and, and congratulations and, and I didn't want to say her last name and not say her Barrio. I wasn't sure. Oh, oh, Barrio, that's it. Meredith Barrio. Well, congratulations to her and congratulations to your office. I know how hard your staff, you and your staff work. And it's Thank it's you. great to, to receive recognition that, in fact, that, you know, your office is trending in the right direction for uh, for the people. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, what are your recent reports? And you, you kind of teased it a little bit in regards to uh, local government. Uh, generated was in regards to the state's pilot program for solar facilities. Pilot, of course, is an acronym for paid in lieu of taxes. Now, I guess there's a decision that was made by an appellate tax board. And there was some confusion that it caused amongst local town and city governments. Um, how did this issue with the program come to be audited or, or recognized by uh, your office? Well, so this was uh, a matter for our division of local mandates. Um, we actually looked at two different kinds of payment in lieu of taxes programs uh, within the state. One is the payments that the state makes directly to municipalities uh, in lieu of taxes for certain facilities that are housed there. Uh, uh, corrections facilities, maybe, or the fire training academy, not every agency that has that owns land in uh, in a municipality uh, and serves a, a state government purpose carries with it a payment in lieu of taxes payment. But we looked at that. But then we also looked at this whole payment in lieu of taxes situation for the big commercial solar arrays that um, so many communities are having installed as to create an alternative form of energy. So years ago, you might remember, um, and really decades ago, um, when solar uh, installations were being encouraged on residential properties, um, it was decided that the, the, the value of the residential solar uh, equipment would not be added to a home's value and therefore increase the property tax payment. So those improvements, you know, if you add a wing to your house, that improvement is going to result in a greater assessment and you're going to pay a greater tax property tax bill. Well, they didn't want that rule to apply to solar because they wanted to encourage people to do it. So they made those the solar installations tax exempt. And then when commercial solar arrays came, um, came along, um, those were to be understood to be paying property taxes because they were occupying acres of of land and communities weren't going to give that source of revenue up, but um, they worked out payments in lieu of taxes uh, so that there was more predictability both on the part of the town who would be getting money from the solar developers and also on the part of solar developers who wouldn't be subject to fluctuations in um, in taxation so they would work out payment plans over a multi-year period and that was fine until some solar developers started challenging municipalities they didn't want to pay make these payments in lieu of taxes and they went to the appellate tax board and the appellate tax board looked at the only law that there was on the books and they said hmm 
This law that has traditionally been applied to residential solar installations doesn't say only residential solar installations. So we're going to interpret it as meaning commercial ones as well. And, and there have been a series of appellate tax board decisions that have really put municipalities in quite a tizzy because no longer were solar developers willing to negotiate uh, payments in lieu of taxes. And it really had, in, the, in recent years, the effect of suppressing the expansion of these facilities. I mean, granted, there are other reasons why some communities have established moratoriums. You know, some of it just has to do with the vast amounts of uh, clear cutting that goes on to accommodate some of these arrays, uh, cutting down of trees. But it, it, it also had to do with the loss of, uh, of, public, uh, of public revenue. Um, and you know, you're, you're close to local government, so you can, you can appreciate uh, the, the, the problem that that, that that posed. So we took a look at this situation because again, it was state decision-making that was having an impact on local revenues. Uh, and, we, and we just said, you know, this, this can't, it, this is unsustainable as a, as a policy. Um, thankfully, uh, you know, bringing it to the attention of the, of the wider uh, world helped spur the activity uh, in the last legislative session on this issue, there had been some legislation to uh, to uh, try to distinguish between large generators of solar power and small ones, and it we helped to bring together municipal assessors and other local officials as well as solar developers to reach some agreement on this, and it was contained in the climate change bill that the legislature. Uh, had uh, put before the governor. And I was going to ask you about that is because I understood that the, the pending climate change bill <clears throat> was supposed to help clear that up. Did yeah. the auditor's office or your report have any uh, impact on any language or amendments that were added to the bill? Um, we didn't recommend specific um, uh, uh, formulas that they would use to determine uh, how, you know, how many how, how much power to, that would be generated would be a cutoff that would distinguish a residential from a commercial. But what we did was, was just spur the conversation forward and bring the parties to a resolution because we just helped create that opportunity for the conversation to take place. And so there was some back and forth between the legislature and the governor on other elements of the uh, climate change bill, um, but this uh, this was not an element of um, of, uh, of contention between the governor and the legislature. So that will uh, it, that will stand. Probably so, one of my last go ahead. One of my last questions on on this would be is, is knowing that solar is such a challenging industry, it seems as though it's going to be difficult to continuously gauge the taxation for that set of equipment. So it sounds like it might be something we're gonna be keeping an eye on. Yeah, so so now payments in lieu of taxes are back. You know, it's, it's, they may not be subject to property taxes, but they but the, pub, the pil payments in lieu of taxes will uh, provide that stream of revenue to the communities that uh, would be lost otherwise. And it gets us to a greener future. Definitely, indeed. Again, if you're just tuning in, we are speaking with the state auditor, Suzanne Bump. She is my guest for this segment. Uh, our next uh, discussion uh, is in regards to the, uh, the pol new police reform law. It was a bill. Uh, yeah. At the end of 2020, the governor, Governor Baker, actually signed into law that new uh, piece of legislation. I believe the audit's office assembled a study that called for expanded resources and accountability when it comes to police training in Massachusetts. Uh, what were the main deficiencies that the report was able to highlight? Well, back at the end of 2019, we looked again at the cost burden for, uh, borne by municipalities of police training. The state said every police officer has to have 40 hours of training, but you're gonna have, essentially, they, they said, you're gonna to have to figure out how you're gonna pay for it yourself. And so communities were putting upwards of $23 million into police training and the state uh, was providing very little support for that through its municipal police training uh, 
commission. Um, we, we told the state that they had to be doing they had to be doing better. It's too much of a burden for municipalities. We need police that are skilled, not just in gun handling, but in dealing with mental health crises and domestic violence and sexual assault and the range of social issues that unfortunately our police have to respond to. It's not just traffic accident reconstruction. There are a lot of skills that our police officers have to have and the state has been doing a disservice to them. We also said though, you know, while you're at it, while you're focused on training, why don't we have a mechanism to ensure that all police are getting trained because we found in our work that that was not the case because many towns couldn't afford it. Um, and we said, uh, so let's have a system that exists in 44 or 46, 46 other states, which is peace officer standards and training. It is essentially a certification program for police that ensures not just that they're getting the training that they need, but that also uh, there is accountability for any disciplinary procedures that they go through stemming from things like excessive use of force. And, and when we put that out, uh, at the end of 19, 2019, there was some interest in it, but it wasn't until uh, we had the, the death of George, George Floyd um, when people really started to pay attention to how adequately police were trained um, and how adequately police were policed. And so our recommendations helped inform that part of the bill that was put I get through the legislature and onto the onto the governor's desk. You know, we weren't involved with deciding uh, questions or making recommendations about use of force by police and no knock warrants and the like. But the whole notion of accountability and support for our police officers, uh, you know, we helped we helped to advance. Our our work was cited numerous times. Um, by all the parties, the chiefs of police had been advocating for this for years, and we, you know we so we gave a lot of credibility to the uh, to the needs of the police chiefs. Yeah, some of the information that was put out there actually said, stated that eighty four percent of the uh, police chiefs in the Commonwealth were in favor of this and yes. in favor of such legislation like this. Right, because they knew that that um, they weren't doing all they could to support their own officers because they lacked the resources to do so. So, uh, you know, so we have a law that's enacted, but of course, you know, it, now it's about the funding. And so uh, I actually just within the past couple of days met with the, uh, virtually of course, with the Secretary of Public Safety about how well implementation is going. Um, and the, the, the police departments are being very you know, cooperative and getting all of the information fed into a central database and setting up systems and standards. We still have a way to go. Um, and a lot more money though needs to be put into the, uh, into the training uh, on the part of the state. A, a major piece of legislation like this that has been turned into a law, is there a chance that your office could uh, revisit and take a look at this law in a few years just to kind of see how it's trending and how it's doing? Yeah, no doubt we will. We will do that. Yeah. And so while the work was initiated by our local mandates division, it will be the audit operations that will go in uh, to see that the funding is there, uh, that they are indeed um, you know, implement created that they have created standards that they're implementing those standards it's going to take a lot of coordination with local police departments um let me tell you this is not going to be simple uh there, there's a, there are a lot of of standards and rules and processes um you know to, uh, because it's it's one thing to accuse an officer of uh inappropriate behavior he has a right though to uh defend himself against those allegations so that will take place at the local level, and then it will kind of escalate up to the um, up to the level of the state um, uh, folks who are certifying that 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 officer can stay on the force or not. Yeah, if you're tuning in, we are speaking with the state auditor Suzanne Bump. She's our guest for this segment. Uh, as we roll into our final uh, part of the conversation, 
I have to ask you in regards to the pandemic. I mean, we're all dealing with it in our own certain ways. How have you and your office been able to endure COVID-19 and still do business as usual? Well, you know, uh, I have to say that we're really fortunate in that we already had a lot of staff who were used to working out of the office. Auditors, when they are doing field work, yeah, they are out of the office with their computers in somebody else's office, <laughs> uh, looking looking over documents and and uh, and processes and the like. And so, uh, you know, we uh, saw this saw this coming. Um, and a lot of and, and a lot of others of us had laptops anyway, just as a matter of course. But we quickly had everybody outfitted with uh, with computers and set up our systems so that we could work from home. And we naturally there were a lot of logistics that still had to be carried out after the fact. But we were able to quickly put together the planning that was necessary. Um, and the planning, not just with technology, but also the planning in um, how were we going to ensure that there wasn't a lot of downtime for staff? Uh, because we did encounter some difficulties uh, for a short time in getting information from other state agencies that weren't as flexible as we were in going virtual. And so there was a lot of information that we were requesting from, uh, from agencies that we were auditing uh, that, they, that the folks that we were talking to didn't have access to because it was back in the office on the mainframe computers or in files and they were at their home in, uh, in Abington. So, uh, so it, was, it was, how were we gonna keep things flowing, but we were able to do it. Um, we had our same level of audit output and uh, by, you know, by all of our measures, we were able to, uh, you know, to keep pace with, uh, with our work. Did you find that it created additional work, especially when it came in the areas of COVID relief spending? Because I know that there were, there were a lot of different initiatives that were put forth, whether to assist small businesses, whether it was PPP, whatever it may have been. Right. You had federal right. government CARES Act money coming in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I think that most people don't appreciate um, the scale of the federal support that has come to the state. Sixty-eight billion dollars worth of assistance. Now that didn't all come to the state government, uh, uh, but uh, in fact. Most of it came in the form of the payment protection program that you just that you just referenced. That was thirty eight billion dollars went to prop up local businesses in the state. Now, we won't be auditing that. Um, and then there was uh, eighteen billion dollars that went to supplement uh, unemployment assistance, because if you recall, there were extra stipends and people were able to stay on longer because of the unique circumstances provided um, by, the, by the pandemic, that still leaves a very large chunk of money that has gone, some, in some cases, directly to our colleges and universities, uh, principally to give out in the form of student financial aid. Um, but it also supported all kinds of operations in state government. If you just think about a, a, a group home um, that's supporting uh, developmentally disabled uh, uh, folks. You know, a state a state program. Uh, they needed se special support in order to uh, to continue to serve their clients. And you know, and then you look at the Department of Public Health, which is having its hands more than its hands full um, with public health programming. So there are a lot of state agencies uh, and programs within those agencies that re have received millions and millions of dollars from the federal government. Um, we have already begun trying to determine how it is that and who it is uh, that we will be auditing on uh, to see how well they have spent the money. Um, we have a way, we've already begun a process of, of looking at the riskiest agencies. You know, that would be agencies that had a lot of money and had to spend it in a short time. And maybe we have seen in our past audits that they didn't necessarily 
always do a great job in protecting resources and, and uh, procuring supplies and services. So we are formulating our, our plan when we get a little further down the road in terms of the spending and the reporting on the spending, then we will begin um, our audits to, to ensure that the state uh, and all of the people uh, that they contracted with have done the right thing with that money. And we want to find flaws in the spending uh, first uh, here at the state level, because eventually the federal government's going to be looking. And if they find fault, then the state will have to pay money back. And we don't want to be in that situation. So um, actually, I'm working cooperatively with the governor's office on this and the state comptroller on this. Um, I had recommended back in May that we take uh, the approach that uh, state government did during our last recession. Do you remember when Obama first, President Obama first took office um, and the economy had crashed yep. and they had the American um, Recovery and Reinvestment Act. And that brought a lot, to, that brought tens, hundreds of millions of dollars into the state. Uh, we did a lot of shovel ready um, uh, infrastructure investment projects with that and supported public education and the, and the like. Um, at, and at the time, uh, Governor, Governor Patrick uh, set up a coordinated working group with the IG and the AG, the auditor, the comptroller, uh, you know, to, to get an early jump on uh, looking at how that money was, uh, was spent. So I adv advised the governor to rep replicate that Put on, put on the state's website, just as had been done under the Patrick administration, detailed information. So if somebody wanted to find out how the COVID money has been spent in this state, who are the contractors that wanted to, that, you know, that, that got the contracts for PPE or whatever it is, you can go to, to the state's website, mass.gov slash COVID-19, and there's a full accounting of all of the allocations and who the money has gone to so far. We have been speaking with the state auditor, Suzanne Bump. The Office of the State Auditors conducts performance audits in state government programs, departments, agencies, authorities, contractors, and vendors. Interesting note here is that uh, the OSA uh, issues recommendations to improve accountability, efficiency, and transparency, and has identified $1.3 billion in unallowable and questionable, potentially fraudulent spending, right. saving opportunities for the Commonwealth. Interesting last sentence here is last year, auditees reported implementation of 92% of the auditor, uh, auditor office's audit recommendation. I wanna thank you so much for being my guest on this, uh, on this program. It's been such a pleasure, Kevin. It's great to see you. Stay, uh, stay healthy. I look forward to seeing you again in person. Sounds like a plan and a quick uh, shout out to Noah for doing a great job and helping us organize this conversation. Thank you.